Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching a brand new edition of The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. India and the US will aim to further solidify their global strategic partnership in the inaugural 2 plus 2 dialogue on Thursday with a focus on significantly boosting military ties and ironing out differences over India's defense engagement with Russia and crude oil import from Iran. The two sides will also seek to finalize a pact on encrypted defense technologies, deliberate on ways to boost counter-terror cooperation, look for increasing engagement between their navies in the Indo-Pacific region, and try to resolve tariff-related issues. External Affairs Minister Shushma Swaraj and Defense Minister Nirmala Sitaraman will hold the twice-postponed talks with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis. Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff General Joseph Dunford will also be a part of the U.S. delegation. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the upcoming 2 plus 2 talks between India and the United States. Joining me on the program today are Major General Ashwini Sivach, retired defense expert, Professor Harshvi Panth, Head Strategic Studies Observer Research Foundation, Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat, and Smita Sharma, Deputy Editor of the Tribune. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin with you. Finally, the talks are on track after being postponed on two occasions. The talks are almost here. Absolutely. I think next uh, uh, day, tomorrow, because both the leaders are coming in uh, today. Uh, Secretary uh, Jim Mattis from Islamabad, he should be flying in uh, today evening along with General Dunford, as you mentioned, Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, Mike Pompeo will be coming from Washington. So this has been uh, twice postponed. Once in April it was scheduled to be, but uh, at that time Rex Tillerson, he got sacked, so it couldn't happen. And then after that, on the 6th of July, when uh, uh, Mike Pompeo was required to go to North Korea, because this was in the aftermath of the uh, talks between uh, uh, President Trump and uh, uh, Kim Jong-un on the 12th of June. In hindsight, it's, it seems like it was the wrong thing to do. It was the wrong thing to do, but I'm glad now the talks are happening because uh, decision about these talks, uh, Frank, as uh, you know, was taken last year in June when uh, Prime Minister Modi had visited Washington, D.C. at the invitation of President uh, Donald Trump. And then it was decided that uh, this uh, top uh, leadership would uh, meet, would get together. So it's, uh, uh, I think it could be billed as uh, one of the most significant uh, uh, foreign policy engagements as far as India is concerned as of, of this year. Meaning we of course had the 10 uh, leaders of uh, ASEAN countries in January. We'll have President Putin coming here in uh, uh, next month in uh, October. But I think along with that this also would be very very significant because uh, the United States is undoubtedly the most significant partner of India at this stage. Hmm. So whatever we can do in terms of, you know, you have uh, said there have been a number of uh, positive uh, decisions that have been taken, whether it is the upgradation of India from uh, uh, STA to the security trade authorized, the strategic trade authorization to, to STA 1, which really opens up a very large segment of uh, dual use technologies, sensitive technologies that India can import from there, right. whether it is in the area of, uh, you know, naming the Pacific Command as Indo-Pacific Command, the two meetings of the Quad that has taken place. So what should the role of the Quad be and what is what can its objectives be? So I think there are such a large number of areas, of course, in the positive side, but also in terms of challenges what you mentioned Iran right. you mentioned Russia so I think uh, this whole gamut of uh, bilateral ties and regional and global uh, developments all of them are going to be discussed all right uh, professor what's likely to be on the table contentious issues too to be discussed do you think uh, yes absolutely it seems that at the moment at least um, uh, those contentious issues seems uh, seem to have taken center stage. We are discussing uh, the impact of uh, CADSA on, uh, on our uh, dealings with Russia. We are looking at uh, what is the impact of uh, sanctions on Iran on our dealings with, uh, with, with Iran um, per se. So I think there is, uh, and, and in, if you look at the popular opinion, popular media narrative, uh, they seem to be uh, at the center, partly because I think the big debate in U.S.-India relations today is whether the strategic narrative that has driven this relationship 
over the last few decades uh, is one that will continue in the, in, in the, in, 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 under the Trump administration and whether the transactionalist approach of Trump administration would take over. So I think that is something that, uh, that we would be, you know, everyone who is interested in this relationship would, would be watching very, clear, very, very carefully out of, this, uh, out of this engagement. But as the ambassador pointed out, the issues, uh, the larger issues on the table are so significant in terms of the strategic partnership uh, that I think at times it's easy uh, to miss uh, the woods for the trees. So I think uh, perhaps that, would, that won't happen and perhaps the larger issues that have driven this relationship would continue to occupy the center stage. There are uh, contentious issues on the table uh, which uh, one hopes that would be resolved uh, with, a, with some amount of uh, careful um, uh, diplomatic management. But by and large, it seems to me that uh, both sides believe that this is a relationship that needs to be uh, uh, you know, taken seriously. We have seen statements from the top leadership on both sides of the equation, uh, terming it as very important uh, meeting. And I think the very fact that we are having two plus two means that the two countries have recognized that the relationship no longer or cannot be just at the level of bureaucracies. It needs to be at the top political end where you can set the tone and the tenor of this relationship from the very top. So I think that's a very positive sign overall. Right. Smita Sharma, as a journalist, what is something that you're going to be keeping your eye on as far as this dialogue is concerned and what would you like to see coming out of it? Uh, you know, of course, this is, as uh, Ambassador Sajjan Har mentioned, that this is clearly the highest political engagement that India is having with the U.S. and one of the most significant foreign policy dialogues for this year. Donald Trump is not expected to come in any time in this year, so this is going to be the highest one. Uh, U.S., while John Kerry was the Secretary of State, did have a strategic commercial dialogue with India, which was a one-time affair. Uh, this is going to be turned into an annual event. So so important issues on the table there. If I may just clarify one point, though, it's actually Pompeo who's coming in from Pakistan. He's reached Pakistan even as we talk. And Pompeo is not just accompanied by General Dunford. He interestingly also has Ambassador Zalmi Khalilzad, who has just been re reappointed in a way to State Department as the new U.S. advisor on Afghanistan. He's an old hand in the region. Um, he's served through four U.S. administrations, especially on AFPAC region. And interestingly, he was actually a close aide of George Bush. Uh, when the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan happened post the 9-11 attacks. So, uh, and the Taliban, in a way, got ousted. So uh, he has been given that singular mission of trying to talk to the Taliban, of looking at the reconciliation efforts. And that's a missive that's going to be given to the new Imran Khan government in Pakistan as well. Because today, if you look at the remarks that Pompeo made en route to the accompanying press, he made it very clear that, uh, you know, we need Pakistan fully on board as far as our efforts in Afghanistan is concerned. But as far as India is concerned, uh, sources clearly saying that trade is going to be top of the agenda. It is going to be a transactional talk. Uh, of course, you have India's own interests because it is wanting to acquire the S-400 anti-triumph uh, missiles from Russia at a cost of 40,000 crore rupees. You need to know the impact of sanctions. So the American sanctions on Russia, will there be a carve out or not? Uh, US so far has sounded non committal about it. Uh, from India's side, Iran is a major issue because 25% of Ira India's crude oil needs are still met with Iran. Right. It's not possible to switch overnight unless you have alternate reliable options, sustainable options for fuel supply, which are also cheap. Pricing is important. But the Indian, in fact, uh, the setup in South Bloc is trying to drive home the point that look, for Donald Trump, one of the biggest irritants today vis-a-vis -vis India is the trade deficit, which favors India, and he wants that to be closed in. And they are trying to drive home the point that we have started importing oil and gas from U.S. for the first time, a billion and a half dollars of trade done already. This year, we are expecting two and a half billion dollars of uh, oil imports from the U.S. So these are ways that India is looking at in terms of increasing imports to reduce the trade deficit so that India, U.S. is in a better mood. But right. U.S. does say that, of course, India is very important as far as its success, be it in the AFPAC strategy is concerned or the Indo-Pacific strategy Indeed. is concerned. Indeed. A lot to talk about there as far as Afghanistan and Pakistan are concerned. But let's focus now on the S-400. Uh, uh, General, why is it so important to us? And do you believe that we can carve something out as far as this particular deal is concerned and get some kind of a breather from the United States? There is no denying the fact as far as this S-4 Trump, which is... Uh, air defense missile system is very important. This is the best weapon system available in the world market today. The only one which is very close or which can be compared is THAAD, which is Termini High Altitude Area Defense System, which Americans have deployed in South Korea and Guam. However, as far as S-400 is concerned, Triumph, 
it is far far superior than this well, the reasons are this that the range of this is about 400 km it can uh, multiple targets can be engaged by that it it can detect then track and then shoot and the stealth uh, you know technology of uh, f35 which was there this can beat that and for an area like ncr one regiment is required and therefore india has made it very clear whether you are katsa or no katsa that is basically uh, what americans are trying to put we will go as far as for trump is concerned it is no match to third third is far inferior to that, so that and therefore is, this is the bottom line so Bo that is non negotiable non negotiable okay. and i am sure the waiver will be given by by the america because countering america adversary through sanction the act which is their cards are which has been brought there is there is a silver line that the waiver can be given by the president of uh, the uh, us i am sure it is going to give it the one point which coming is that the turkey is also uh, buying uh, you know this s4 trump but there the catch is that once the turkey is buying s400 air defense missile system they are not be they have been denied now f35 aircraft by the america that's what chinese have it so overall what i'm saying is as on today strategically s4 trump air defense missile system is very much required by our country whether katsa or no katsa whether waiver given or not india will go for it i'm sure america is realized it there will be some sort of understanding which will come and the president of us will give the waiver and because this weapon system is too high now i was only trying to bring out why america is trying to bring third because third is today they want to sell it third is the many high altitude area defense system which they have deployed there in south korea and guam island which is which was there under the target of north korea hmm. but unfortunately it does not have that stealth technology it is not at par with as for points taken and the another thing which is going to be a very sticky issue will be uh, oil you see iran we have told two things as far as the nuclear energy security is concerned iran is a very important partner of india mm. india has been dealing with this for long india iran is the third largest oil supply to india now the point which comes is that all of a sudden on fourth november because that since america has come out of the nuclear deal and after fourth november you cannot import any oil from from iran as far that card size concern so we are trying to bring out we we agree on the one issue that iran should not go nuclear but he has got all the right to use nuclear energy for peaceful reason right. for us for us why iran is very important is we have heavily invested in charbagh right. which which is a port which is bypassing pakistan and going to afghanistan and going to a central asian state Point we are taken. telling america that if you look after iran char bar port is available to you also to going to afghanistan not only dependent on pakistan right so you're giving an alternative to the united states as well through chabahar is what the, uh, the general is suggesting the general of course is optimistic ambassador that the united <coughs> states is going to give us some kind of a waiver as far as uh, russia is concerned and maybe even iran is what he is suggesting uh, do you believe that trump is going to allow that yes because he's been very rhetorical as far as you know what he wants to do with iran yeah, that and is, with uh, russia is concerned that's true frank but i am uh, very hopeful i'm very sanguine because uh, uh, you know basically when katsa was put in position actually it is an act that has been brought by the congress and congress wants to punish uh, uh, russia and really the target that they had in front of them was turkey because turkey was buying the s uh, 400 triumph uh, missile system anti missile system from them and if you look at the discussions that have taken place over the last uh, two months or so uh, and the sort of messages the sort of communications that have gone both from secretary of state mike pompeo and also uh, defense secretary james mattis to the congress saying that there are countries like india which are not really the target of katsa and they should not be made the victims of this particular uh, 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 law and it is in that context that the waiver the special waiver that has been granted it is to countries like india indonesia vietnam so i think the focus of katsa will continue to be on uh, turkey and we should really be able to get a waiver there is of course can we expect a waiver announcement after these talks maybe uh, maybe after the uh, talks uh, but i think uh, there would be adequate indications there would be adequate signals that will be given out although it might be sort of you know left uh, 
to the Congress because there, I'm sure there are procedures that are involved because it is the president who has to provide this, uh, 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 you know, has to send out this message to the Congress, sign out on a paper that this country is following those, meeting those conditions and so on and so forth. So if it uh, uh, happens, if it appears right after this meeting, or I'm sure adequate signals will definitely be given out that this is it going to It is for to us there. to pick up the signals. It is for us to pick up the signals. Right. And just one last mm. comment on the oil also, because that is also what you mentioned. Right. I think oil also, 4th November, it is, this is not under the Katsa, this is under the May 8th, uh, determination that the president had made that he is withdrawing from the JCPOA, from the Iranian nuclear deal. So there also, if it says that by 4th November, you have to cut down all, bring your uh, uh, supplies to zero, I think that will not be, it is not feasible. I think sustainability of the world energy market also has to be seen. Right. Iran brings about 2.7 million barrels of oil per day to the market. And mm. we have been importing about 600 to 700,000 barrels, which as uh, Smita mentioned, you know, it's about uh, 20 odd percent right now, second largest supplies. I think there also we should be able to, and our interlocutors in my view, are positively inclined. Both uh, Secretary Pompeo and Mattis, they are in, uh, positively inclined as far as strengthening the bilateral strategic partnership with India is concerned. All right. Professor, uh, let's talk about Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, right before 2 plus 2, of course, we had the news of the United States cancelling the $300 million military aid to Pakistan. Do you believe that Pakistan and Afghanistan are going to come up in these talks? And what would we like to hear from the U.S.? Well, I think uh, it's very reasonable to expect that uh, Mr. Pompeo coming from uh, Islamabad uh, would be giving India an indication of what perhaps American strategy going forward uh, on, on the region is, um, is going to be. Because I think there are some con conflicting signals that America has sent and there are concerns in Delhi uh, about the future of what is happening in uh, the FPAC space. Because on the one hand, we have... Uh, uh, the South Asia strategy that was announced uh, last year. There have been indications that uh, President Trump is rethinking on some of the assumptions of those of that strategy. Uh, and uh, we don't really know what that rethink is going to amount to, apart from the fact that we have seen some discussions, back-channel negotiations already happening between the Taliban and the American representative uh, in, in, in Doha recently. So I think that there are, uh, there are conflicting signals emanating about the future uh, of what might uh, what Americans might do in, in, in Afghanistan. But in Pakistan, I think we are we seem to be converging more and more. And I think um, it, is, it is very interesting that the Trump administration actually has taken a position in the very f uh, first years of its uh, of its term, uh, which uh, typically American uh, presidents take at the end of their term. So in that sense, there is a growing convergence there. There is the sense that uh, the new government of Imran Khan is not being given the benefit of doubt that used to be par for the course in the past. Uh, that they have cancelled this uh, three million, three hundred million dollars of aid, uh, signifying that Americans are toughening their position, the, their posture towards Pakistan, and of course, uh, what it means in terms of operation, uh, operational realities on the ground remains to be seen. Uh, whether America will be able to continue with that, uh, with the thrust uh, and with the push. Uh, in making Imran Khan government more accountable in, uh, towards the act activities of terrorism that emanate from Pakistan. But I think by and large that is, that is something that, America, that Indians would like to hear uh, from their American interlocutors as to what, uh, they, what, what is the message they have given to Pakistan hmm. and what they are trying to do in Afghanistan because there is actually no clarity on what Americans uh, are up to. And therefore for India to, ha to frame a response to the changing realities, it would mean that India would need to listen more and would need to therefore frame accordingly its own response to the evolving realities on, on the ground. Right, right. Talking about uh, Afghanistan now, you know, Asmita Sharma, uh, the, Uni the United States in the past has asked us to play a more proactive role in Afghanistan. Now, what is that proactive role that they want us to play and uh, what can we do really as far as Afghanistan is concerned? Uh, larger development role, more economic assistance for sure. 
because they do know that the Indian <coughs> continuing position of no boots on the ground, that's not going to be changed, not by this government, not by a government that comes into place post-2019 anytime soon. But I can tell you from my interaction with a lot of senior American officials that they do feel frustrated at the speed of delivery of projects that India undertakes in its neighborhood, including in Afghanistan. While in Afghanistan, of course, you do have a lot of visible uh, outcomes in terms of Indian assistance today, the $2 billion in aid that we talk about, uh, be it the parliament building, roads, the, uh, the highways or dams, cricket stadiums, but all of them have taken a lot of time to be delivered. So the American officials do believe that India can do a lot more. It can open up its purses a little more in terms of trying to help Afghanistan. Of course, we've seen India and China, uh, you know, when Pr Prime Minister Modi met with President Xi Jinping at Wuhan, they decided that they could do some joint economic assistance project, just like India decided with South Korea as well. So, but these are essentially going to be capacity building, where mm. Korea funds Afghan soldiers to come into India and get trained because it's much easier for them. Similarly, Afghan policemen getting capacity building programs in India. But I guess, you know, what's important is if you look at Mike Pompeo's comments to the press today, uh, there is no real mention of terrorism per se, which is a terrorism that India is more interested in terms of the terror outfits that are operating from Pakistan targeting India. These are things that have been under discussion, of course, in the Homeland Security Dialogue. But Pompeo is constantly talking about the reconciliation efforts with Taliban. That's where he wants Pakistan to come on the same page. And Afghanistan is his priority. It is the important theater for Donald Trump, who does not believe that American taxpayers' money should continue to be put into a country where the forces have been in place for so many years mm. and the results hardly visible because he's a businessman at the end of the day and he has promised jobs back home he has promised to bring back the soldiers so uh, these are going to be crucial and sources in new delhi are saying that they are looking at a direct perspective of what transpired when pompeo zalmi khalilzad general dunford meet with prime minister imran khan they meet with the pakistan army chief before arriving in delhi later tonight so right. that's going to be an important missive as to what is their message to the new civilian government which at the end of the day will still have to rely on the garrison headquarters in rawalpindi for its foreign policy and security directives. Indeed. Moving on from Afghanistan and Pakistan, now let's talk about the other neighbor. Is China going to come up uh, in the talks, uh, General? China can come because China is also now trying to play a role in Afghanistan. You see, China is very cleverly understanding this China-Pakistan economic corridor is going through a very disturbed area as far as Pakistan is concerned. Bold, the Belt Road Initiative has already taken a hit all across the world. People are now start understanding it. It is nothing but a debt trap. It is happening in Malaysia. It is happening in Sri Lanka. And it is going to happen in Pakistan. And as far as China is concerned, they know it. That in case the BRI, as far as China-Pakistan economic corridor is to succeed, it wants peace and stability in the area. Especially in Afghanistan and also in the POK side. Because it is passing through Khaibir, Pakutankwa and then to Baluchistan. So as far as China is concerned, China wants to have its own signature and footprints in Afghanistan. Any peace talk which take place, which culminate, China also wants to have its say. Now the point which is coming is, as far as Pakistan is concerned, my point is that ki America is putting a pressure just them to toe their line. Ch Pakistan is a frontline state. Pa America knows that Pakistan is required as far as Taliban is concerned. Talib Pakistan can put a lot of pressure on Taliban. America wants the Taliban should come on a negotiating table and this has to happen through Pakistan only. And Pakistan only have that much leverage on Taliban that it can put pressure and then the negotiating. Because this talk which has taken place in Doha, a back China diplomacy, it was all orchestrated by through Pakistan. So therefore the point which is coming is that though America outwardly is trying to put pressure on, on Pakistan by denying him that $800 million aid which Pakistan say it, it is a coalition sport fund, not the military aid. Certainly, aim is to put pressure on Pakistan twofold. One is that it stops signing Haqqani group and Taliban faction to uh, Afghanistan and create uh, in turmoil there. Second thing is put adequate pressure on Taliban for them to come on a negotiating table along with Afghan government and America. So it is the interest of America to utilize Pakistan to their advantage. Here comes a catch. Where does the India play a role? As far as India is concerned, what we are trying to convey, capacity building and all, everything looks very nice. 
But where does the India stand in case if we do not have any communication with the government which is going to come in future, which looks like that the Taliban will have a major role. So therefore, to me, it looks like that we should see the writing on the wall. We should also open some sort of front with Taliban directly because in future, any government which is coming in Afghanistan will have a lot of say as far as Taliban is concerned. Okay. So to me, it looks like that India has a major role to play. India has to guard its own interest. America is playing its own game. China will play its own. Pakistan will play own. We have to play our own game. We have already heavily invested in Charbar only to take care of Afghanistan. Therefore, in Afghanistan, let us open a front, direct front with Taliban, have talk with them, and let's be relevant in Afghanistan rather than irrelevant. You've heard what the general has to say. I'm very keen to understand what the ambassador has to say about this now. Open a channel with the Taliban is what the general is suggesting and take care of your own interests because everyone is playing their own game in the region. You know, definitely everyone is uh, trying to take care of their own interest and India is also doing that. And, uh, you know, we always uh, go by what our previous experience has been. As you know, what Einstein said that if you follow the same path and expect different results, then you are a fool. And uh, so we have seen what uh, Taliban is all about. So I would be very, very cautious before opening any sort of direct front uh, with the Taliban. I think what we need to do is to tell uh, the Americans also when they are care. And I think this will be uh, an excellent uh, uh, opportunity to tell them that uh, there is no good that is going to happen uh, uh, by sort of, you know, reaching out to the Taliban. Because uh, uh, you look at whatever has happened even in recent years, where, recent months also, you know, in Uzbekistan, you had a big uh, conclave, big uh, uh, conference on Afghanistan. They invited the Taliban. Taliban did not come. In the Moscow format talks, they have not come. In the Heart of Asia format, in the Kabul format, they have not come. They are not, I think they are expanding their own uh, presence there. So it's if a you, lost cause is what you're suggesting. It's a lost cause. And if you uh, permit, I'll you know, respond to your question that you had posed to the general. Will China be an element of talks? Definitely. China, Indo-Pacific, is going to be, in my view, the centerpiece of talks. And, you know, what do we do as far as security making Indo-Pacific an open, free, inclusive and prosperous area? What do we do as far as Quad is concerned? Because we have seen that after taking over South China Sea, militarization, hmm. occupation, development, etc., of all these islands in South China Sea, I think this only seems to have whetted the appetite of China. Right. So what I've got does... a limited time, Ambassador, so let me get in the others as well, yes, because I've got yes. just two minutes left on the program. Uh, Professor, taming the dragon on the agenda is what the Ambassador is suggesting, not in as many words, but that's what he's suggesting at the end of the day. Balancing China. <laughs> Balancing China, all right. Yes. Well, it has been the defining aspect of Indo-US relationship for quite some time. So when we said that the st strategic logic of the relationship is what has been driving this relationship forward over the last few decades. It has been the fact that this balance of power is changing in the Indo-Pacific and how do you make a, bal a the balance of power conducive to Indian interests and to American interests. And I think there is something that both uh, Washington and Delhi have been uh, trying to push forth. I think the crucial question is, and, and the initial discussion that we have had, point out that this logic only goes so far in terms of uh, 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 making the case because we and Americans have been making this case for the last two decades. There is an, admi there is an administration now in Washington that wants uh, a bit of a give and take. They want right. transactionalist approach. So what, what is it that we are willing to give and what is it that we, that we want on a priority basis to take from them? And I think that's going to be the essence of the dialogue uh, going forward. All right. Smita Sharma. I think on China, uh, you know, senior sources who have spoken to us have gone at length to try and drive home the point that, look, we have had a reset of ties with Russia, China, everything, and we have transparent, open relations with them. Our relation with U.S. is not going to come at a cost of relation with the other major powers, just like U.S. is not going to recalibrate simply for India's sake. So that's going to be an important tightrope walking for them, because surely in the context of Indo-Pacific, China is going to come up, even if India officially maintains that we do not discuss relation with third parties in bilateral discussions. Right. And a quick point on Afghanistan and Taliban, India is not comfortable definitely in sharing the room with the Taliban. Uh, it has always believed in an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned reconciliation process right. to be led by the government, by the people. And in fact, the Moscow dialogue that was recently called in, the Russian sources came and told us India has confirmed its presence. Mm. Uh, 
U.S. was not willing to go into the room. It ridiculed the process. Right. When the Afghans withdrew yesterday, somebody from the Ministry of External Affairs said that we were only going I've to walk only into the room seconds left, so if Afghans let the could go speak in now. there. General, 30 seconds, your closing comments. As far as China is concerned, that what we were talking about, Indo-Pacific, it is very important. As far as India is concerned, we have to, we should recalibrate our relationship both with China, Russia and America. We should be in such a manner that we should have our own one-to-one -one relation, but not at the cost of one to the another. Right. So therefore, we have to be very realistic. We, as far as China is concerned, are competitors in Indo-Pacific. But when it comes to economic, uh, you know, uh, takeoff, we are not competitors, but we are collaborating. All so right. therefore, our relationship with Russia, China and America must be realistic, not one at the cost of other. All right. On that note, then, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.